Hello ladies, today we begin chapter 8 in our exciting study of Hebrews. Look at this picture of a rainbow by one of my grandchildren. Do you know why God set the rainbow in the sky? He tells us in Genesis 9 verses 13 and 15. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant, a binding agreement, between me and the earth. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. God made a covenant, a binding agreement, and used the rainbow as a sign. Well, God has made several covenants over the many years with humans. Genesis 15, 18. Here, God describes the contract, the promises he made with Abraham as a covenant. In Exodus 34, 27, after God led Israel out of Egypt and brought them to Mount Sinai, he told Moses to write the covenant, the contract, the binding agreement with you and with Israel. Then in Leviticus 26, 12, he describes what that covenant would mean. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. But in, 15, in verses 15 and 16, he says that this contract is conditional. They have to keep the contract. He says, if you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, I will do this to you. And he begins to describe the consequences. And ancient Israel did break that covenant. They drifted. They doubted. They became dull of hearing. They quit listening to God. They disobeyed him. And God swore in his wrath, they will never enter my rest, spiritually or physically. But many years later, God prophesied through Jeremiah that he would make a better covenant with his people. And this prophecy to Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 35, is given in today's text, Hebrews 8. The writer quotes it. Let's read Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 12. Because finding fault with them, he, God says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand, to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. What a beautiful covenant, a promise that God said in the Old Testament that he would make, and he did establish it in the New Testament. And God did establish this new covenant through Jesus, a covenant that would wash away sins. And Jesus verified this when he instituted the Lord's Supper. In Matthew 26, 28, he said, This is the blood of the new covenant. This new covenant is a binding agreement with Christians. But just like the old covenant, it is conditional. The writer of Hebrews says over and over, we must persevere all the way to the end. Ancient Israel broke the covenant, but the Christians in the first century that were reading this letter were considering going back to the old Jewish faith. They were considering breaking God's covenant. And so the writer stresses over and over in Hebrews that God has made a better covenant. Christianity is better than Judaism. Jesus is a better high priest than the ancient uh, Levitical high priest. And he says in chapter 7, where we ended in our last lesson, that this high priest, Jesus, is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and higher than the heavens. He offered himself once and for all, and our sins are forgiven. And through an oath, God appointed his sinless and perfected son forever. And this flows smoothly into the first verse of today's text in chapter 8, verse 1. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. 
This is the main point of the whole letter. We have a great high priest in Jesus, and he's in heaven, serving as our mediator, our intercessor, helping us to keep on keeping on and persevere all the way to the end. And the Hebrews writer here in chapter 8 compares this better priesthood of Jesus with the uh, Levitical priesthood, and he compares the new covenant with that old covenant. And as the study guide says, this chapter will help us better understand the purpose of the law of Moses, and it will help us better appreciate Christianity. Let's look at the Hebrews 8 outline. The main point, <laughs> Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. And then we have a comparison of the ministries of Jesus and the ministries of the uh, Levitical high priest in verses 3 through 6. Then there is a comparison of the covenants, the old covenant of Judaism and the new covenant uh, of Christianity in verses 7 through 13. And under this third part, B, and that was uh, the old covenant was inadequate, verses 7 through 9. The new covenant is written on our hearts, whereas the old covenant was written on stone, verse 10. The new covenant has gifts for Christians, verses 11 and 12. And the new covenant made the old obsolete, verse 13. So now let's look at verse 2 of chapter 8. And it, we had just read that Jesus, our high priest, is in heaven, and he is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, and not man. Now, as the study guide explains, the word minister here is not that Greek word diakonos, which is translated servant in some places and deacon in some places. It's a different Greek word. It is liturgos, which means a public officer of high rank, and it's also translated as a priestly minister, which is what it means here. Jesus is in a high position of authority, and he serves in a better place than the earthly ministers. He serves in a sanctuary and a true tabernacle, which were not made by humans. The Levitical priests did serve in the tabernacle and the two-room sanctuary that was built by humans. And these were types of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle where Christ serves. Where are these true places? We're going to find out in just a few minutes. Christianity replaced the human high priest and the temple. Let's look at page 79 in the study guide. It says, Judaism was never intended to be permanent. God designed the Jewish system of earthly priests, animal sacrifices, and temple worship as a means to bring humanity to Christ. And we're told that in Galatians 3, 24. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. At just the right time, Jesus replaced that old system with a better system. After becoming the once-for-all perfect sacrifice, Jesus replaced human priests and their daily sacrifices. He ministers in a better temple. Now let's look, go back to our text and read verses 3 through 6. These compare the ministries of high priest Jesus with the Levitical priest. Chapter 8, verses 3 through 6. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, it's a capital O, it's talking about Jesus as our high priest, also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he, God said to Moses, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Verse 3. It tells us that those human priests offer gifts which were inanimate offerings like oil and grain, and also sacrifices, which was the blood of animals. So the writer wants them to consider what did this one Jesus as high priest offer? Jesus offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. And we read this in our last lesson in 727, talking about Jesus who does not need daily as those high priests 
to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he, Jesus, did once for all when he offered up himself. Jesus' self-sacrifice is emphasized over and over in the book of Hebrews. Verse 4, For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. When Jesus was living on earth, he couldn't be a priest because he was not from the tribe of Levi. Jesus was from Judah. It says in chapter 7, verse 14, For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah. And you can read all about this in the genealogies. In Matthew 1 and in Luke 3, very interesting genealogies from Adam all the way down to Jesus. And notice that verse 4 says, since there are priests who offer these gifts. This was still going on when the letter to the Hebrews was written. And this is further evidence that the letter was written before 70 AD when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Let's look at verse 5. Those Levitical priests serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. The temple and its elements, they were flawed, they were temporary, but they showed a picture of God's new and better covenant under a better priesthood. And we're getting into some deep theological concepts here. Uh, let's look at page 80 in the study guide. And it explains... Sisters, put on your Old Testament glasses. The writer's going to review temporary elements of the Jewish system and then compare these earthly copies with the heavenly realities. Levitical priests performed their service in a special two-room area. It was called the sanctuary, translated from the Greek phrase, the holy place. Only priests were allowed there. Dividing the two rooms was a large heavy curtain, the innermost room was called the Most Holy Place or the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could enter this room and only once a year, Hebrews 9, 7. On the Day of Atonement, he entered, though not without a washing, special robes, and sacrificial blood. And then he stood before the presence of God, Exodus 25, 8. The veil that guarded this room acted as a barrier between God and the people. When Jesus died, this veil was torn from top to bottom, representing open access to the Father through Christ. And we've read this before. It's just good to repeat and get it cemented in our mind, the difference between elements of the Old Covenant and elements of the New Covenant. The tabernacle and its sanctuary, those two rooms divided by a veil, were copies of the originals. What are the heavenly original tabernacle and sanctuary? From all the commentaries that I studied, here's the answer. The true tabernacle is the church, and the sanctuary is heaven. Scholars assert that the sanctuary, the true holy of holies, or the true most holy place, is where Christ serves in the presence of God. And again, this discussion is rather deep theologically, but we can carefully consider these following facts that are talked about in the study guide. First of all, earthly priests had to go through the tabernacle to get into the sanctuary. Well, <laughs> the only way we can get to heaven is through the church. Scripture says that the Lord and not man erected the true tabernacle in 8.2, and we know that Christ built the church, Matthew 16.18. And another comparison, only priests could go into the sanctuary, those two rooms, and when we're baptized into Christ, we become spiritual priests, 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. We are therefore eligible to enter into God's presence through prayer while on this earth and afterwards in heaven when we die. So the ancient types and the shadows followed a pattern according to this verse. Moses was given a pattern and he built the tabernacle according to God's pattern. Now the spiritual tabernacle, the church, also is given a pattern by God. And the study guide notes, God expected obedience in the type and shadow, the Old Testament uh, type and shadow of heavenly things. And he expects us to follow his specific instructions for worship in the true tabernacle, the church. And scripture gives instructions for New Testament worship for our Bible teaching, prayer, singing, giving, and the Lord's Supper when we worship. Although it was grand, the study guide says, the earthly tabernacle was temporary. It served its purpose. After Jesus shed his blood sacrifice, there was no more need for earthly priests. 
and Neil Lightfoot comments. He says, Jesus as high priest in the new age performs his service in the real heavenly sanctuary. A sanctuary is a real sanctuary only if God is there. And that is precisely what makes the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus ministers the real one. From this, it follows that Christ's priestly service performed in the presence of God outranks that of his predecessors. Now Hebrews 8 verse 6 talks about Jesus' more excellent ministry as a high priest and mediator in the better covenant based on better promises. We see here more excellent, better, and better. So the study guide defines mediator on page 81. A mediator is a person who stands in the middle between two parties, serving as intercessor or reconciler. Moses was the mediator through whom God gave the first covenant, the old law to Israel. But in these last days, God has spoken through his son to mediate a new covenant. So Jesus is the mediator in the new covenant. And Paul proclaimed in 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And Neil Lightfoot commented on Jesus' role as mediator. He stands in the middle between God and man, the ideal representative for both parties. And by his presence, he not only mediates the new covenant, but pledges the fulfillment of it. And verse 6 says that this new covenant is based on better promises. Now, the promises God made to Abraham and to Israel were great, but the promises he makes in the new covenant to Christians is so much better. Let's look at page 82. As mediator, Jesus guarantees the fulfillment of God's promises on which the better covenant was established. In our Christian journey, these promises include mercy, comfort, access to God, intercession, and the forgiveness of sins. And in that better place, God still offers eternal spiritual rest. This offer has always been open, even to those under the law of Moses. But the Hebrews readers and we today have a better mediator and a better covenant. And so now the author of Hebrews is about to quote Jeremiah the prophet as he prophesies about this better covenant in verses 8 through 12. This is part 3 in our outline, verses 7 through 13, comparing the old covenant God made with Israel and the new and better covenant uh, in the Christian age. Uh, the comparison of the covenants according to the outline, verses 7 through 13. The old covenant was inadequate, verses 7 through 9. The old covenant was written on stone, but the new covenant is written on our hearts, verse 10. The new covenant has better gifts, verse 11 and 12. And the new covenant made the old covenant obsolete, verse 13. So now we'll talk about the comparison of the covenants in verses 7 through 13. When you were young, did you sing that song where you learned the books of the New Testament? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and the letter to the Romans. I remember singing that. But I didn't know a song to learn the books of the Old Testament. My grandchildren do. They're way ahead of me when I was at their age, and I'm very proud of them. But the main point is that there are two Testaments, and that we know the difference between the two. In our reading in chapter 8, there's a Greek word, diatheke. And according to Bauer's Greek lexicon, the first meaning is last will and testament. And we're all familiar with that term, last will and testament. The definition is a legal declaration of a person's wishes regarding the disposal of property after death. Well, a last will and testament is very important. Perhaps you've written one. Jesus did. But in order for a last will and testament to be in force, the testator has to die. And so the New Testament, Jesus' last will and testament, became in force only after his death. We find if we look forward to chapter 9, verses 16 and 17, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. And we'll get into that when we're in chapter 9. But it's important for us to understand the second way that DFAK is translated is covenant, contract, binding agreement. That is the term used in verse 6, 
a better covenant, a better DFAK. And so verse 7 says, if that first binding agreement or covenant had been faultless, there would have been no place sought for a second. The study guide on page 82 says this concept helps us see why the first covenant by Moses was described or is described as the Old Testament and the new covenant by Christ is explained as the New Testament. R.N.C. Linsky wrote, The law brought to Israel by Moses is also called a testament and as such is also sealed with blood, but only with the blood of calves and goats. This law testament was temporal and came to an end. The law came in 430 years after the testament that was made for Abraham. And Israel lost its promises because of transgression so that this law testament came to an end. Death alone puts a testament into force. God cannot die, but Jesus God's son can and did. And thus the testament of God stands legally in force. We are beneficiaries. We are heirs of this better New Testament. And those first century Hebrew Christians were also heirs of this better New Covenant. But they were considering returning back to the Old Covenant. How could they think about going back to something that was obsolete, void, nailed to the cross by Christ? There's no benefit in that, and that's why the letter of Hebrews was written. Let's look at page 83 in the study guide. After God's people agreed to the covenant at Mount Sinai, they began to drift, doubt, and become dull of hearing. They complained and wanted to go back to Egypt. When they rebelled at the edge of the promised land, they were not allowed to enter. The Hebrews writer warned readers not to imitate those flawed people living under an inadequate covenant. So, we know that the people were flawed, the covenant was inadequate, so, according to our outline, verses 7 through 9 talks about the inadequacy of this covenant. So, let's read seven through, uh, verses 7 through 9. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Okay, in verse 7, it says that this first covenant, the law made with Israel, was weak, inadequate, and temporary. God has always planned for Jesus to establish the new one. And this is clear in several places. In chapter 7, verse 11, it said, therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? If the, priest, if the, if the Levitical priest were adequate, there would have been no need for Jesus, a new high priest. In chapter 7, verse 18, for on the one hand there is an annulling or a setting aside of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. And then Galatians 3.21, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. So the old law did not give it life. It was inadequate. Study guide, page 83. Hebrews 8, 7 through 9 reiterates the necessity for a new covenant, for the first was inadequate. The law of Moses was a ritualistic, temporary fix for sin. Its mortal, imperfect priests offered animals that did not remove sin. But the new covenant, guaranteed by God's oath and promise, with Jesus as mediator and surety, provides better promises. This message was repeated over and over in the letter so that the immature, dull of hearing readers would get it. Let us also read the letter carefully so that we will get it too. And then Hebrews 8.8 8 says that because there was fault with them, God will establish a new one. And then he quotes Jeremiah's prophecy that God would establish a new and better covenant. And the study guide top, top of page 84 says, 
God allowed the prophet Jeremiah to experience Judah's fall and Babylonian exile and then to comfort. There is hope in your future. Hebrews 8.8 8 quotes this prophecy concerning the better covenant God would make with his people. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Why did the Lord name both Israel and Judah? They were united as one nation when he first made his covenant with them. But under the harsh rule of Solomon's son Rehoboam, they split. Ten tribes went north, made Jeroboam their king, and kept the name Israel. Two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, remained with King Rehoboam and took the name of the larger tribe, Judah. Israel broke covenant with God, and in 722 B.C., they were captured by Assyria. Eventually, Judah's disobedience ended God's patience, and he allowed the Babylonians to conquer that nation around 586 B.C. Therefore, when Jeremiah referred to both Israel and Judah, he was prophesying that one day all of God's people would be united into one body, the church. And we read about that in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So these verses verify that the church is one body, Jesus' body. And there are other groups that God puts together in the church, Jew and Gentile. And this is referenced in Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made both, Jew and Gentile, one, and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity or hostility, that is, the law of commandments contained in its ordinances. And there was differences between them because the Jews had the old law. They, they had that covenant, but the Gentiles didn't. So as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body, that's the church, through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity the division between them. And here's another interesting tidbit. Under the old law, only the free Jewish men were allowed spiritual privileges. But when the church was established, all people were offered salvation and full access to the Father through Christ. Paul made this clear in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And the study guide says in this spiritual Israel, all are one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 28. Robert Milligan summarized God's plan in his Hebrews commentary. He said in the last days under the reign of the Messiah, God would himself complete and bestow upon the house of Israel and upon the house of Judah the arrangement which, though hid for ages, was really intended from the beginning for the benefit of mankind. God had this plan all along. And the study guide says, Sisters, it is wonderful that just as God's people were united at one time in the nation of Israel, his people are now united in the church. And we're part of it. Then we look at the last verse that we're going to talk about in this lesson. And that's verse 9, part of the Jeremiah prophecy. This new covenant was not the same one God made with ancient Israel, the ancestors of these Jewish readers. He made that covenant with Israel only when he led them all the way up to the promised land. And, and Moses was the leader, the mediator. And the establishment of that old covenant is given back in Exodus chapters 19 through 24. And because the Old Testament concepts and people and events are so important and they are uh, like shadows of the new. Let's look at this concept. Exodus 19, 1 through 6. When, this was when God offered that first covenant to Israel. In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the desert of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did 
to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed, here's the, here's the condition, if, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. <laughs> and later we're going to see how this same concept is given in the New, um, the New Testament for Christians today. In chapters 20 through 23, God gives the terms of this covenant, this contract. He lists the commandments and the laws and the principles that they are to obey if they are going to be his people and he's going to be their God. Then in Exodus 24, we see the children of Israel accepting God's covenant. They are agreeing to God's covenant. They are agreeing to the terms of his contract. Exodus 24, 3 through 8. Now he, God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars, according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So there are two concepts here we want to, to remember because we're going to see them at the ratification of the new covenant. One is the ceremony at the covenant ratification involved blood. The new covenant will also involve blood, Jesus' blood. And two, when the old covenant was ratified, the patriarchal age when God talked to the fathers ended. And that's when the mosaical age began, when Moses was mediator and gave that law to the people. And we're going to learn that that age ended when Christ established the new covenant, the Christian age. So we'll begin our next lesson with these concepts. Here are our discussion questions. One, what is the main point of the Hebrews letter and why did the writer emphasize this? Second, compare the copies and the heavenly originals of the sanctuary and tabernacle. And three, how might the reminder of oneness in Christ have helped Jewish readers? How should the concept help people today? Well, I hope you found this study today interesting and enlightening, and we look forward to our next study together.